questions that you've given to us. I pray that you'd be with um, Ms. Michael as she gives us hope, Lord, and continue to work at the Lord that you see her and you're with her. Be with other prayer requests um, that I hear and be with our family, God, and draw them close to you. Give them a heart to love you. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I had to, uh, the music. This was music. I was concerned yeah. I didn't hear the door was open. Yeah, <laughs> I think Brother Doug might have gotten it anyway. Anyway, so, yep, we're online. So good morning to our online friends. All right, so we're going to jump right into the lesson. Um, just a heads up, I had a whole different lesson as of 4 a.m. So this is, you know, where God took it. Um, and once... Because that just throws me into like, oh, you know. Um, but it was, I was really struggling last night putting, you know, bringing it all together. And I was like, this is not good. I, I don't like that we're, we're this headed. And uh, I think my unsurety threw my husband off. He's like, what? You know, I said, I don't know what's going on. But anyway, I was so tired. I, he said, well, go to bed and get up early, um, which I was trying to do it the other way. But, and then when I got up, I was like, okay, clear, ready to bring this all in. And God just said, nope. So this is where we go. So uh, the title of the lesson today is Learning When to Embrace the Hate. Yeah, learning, one. yeah, learning when to embrace the hate. There is no cute little illustration today or anything like that. It is jump right into it and start right with scripture. So even though I have all the scriptures here, we're going to turn in our Bibles uh, just because it's a great thing to do. Second Timothy verses three or chapter three, verse 12. Second to, and y'all are there already. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter three, verse number 12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. So in all these verses, I have uh, chose one word or two to look up in the dictionary, the Webster's 1828, because that, that really helps give us some understanding. Um, and that's, that's a good study tool. So I look those up, and then we have a couple questions that we're going to ask ourselves. I really just feel like the verses that God gave today and the topic, he's just going to have to do the work in the heart because I don't have a lot to add to it. I didn't feel that God wanted me to add a lot to it. Does this make sense to you? Mm -hmm. I feel like it's just, you know, here's the steak. Time to eat. There's no baked potato and sour cream today. There's no broccoli and butter and seasonings. This is steak. This is very meaty, and um, but is what he wants for us. So the verse, Second Timothy three, verse twelve. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So the Webster's eighteen twenty eight word that I looked up was persecution the infliction of pain, punishment, or death upon others unjustly, okay? That unjustly is what really brings that word together because it's not something that the person deserves, um, seemingly deserves. Persecution, the infliction of pain, punishment, or death upon others unjustly. So I always like to go back to the verse and say, 2, Corinthians, or 2 Timothy 3.12, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer infliction of pain, punishment, or death upon others unjustly. You know, I kind of like to clarify it for me. And the questions that I have that we can ask ourselves is the first question. Do I suffer any sort of persecution because I live a godly life? Okay. And going back to that definition, do I suffer any sort of infliction of pain? And that, that pain does not have to just be physical. That can be emotional, you know, um, spiritual, well-being, that kind of thing, that kind of pain too. Do I suffer any sort of persecution because I live a godly life? And then question number two, 
and answer these questions to yourself. Really think about them. And throughout the week, I want you to take this paper home and really think about this, just as I'm going to. Question number two, do I inflict pain of any sort slash punishment on anyone because they live a godly life? And it's not usually we're taking a fork and stabbing somebody. Not that kind of pain. We're not talking about the pain of taking somebody that's living a godly life out back and shooting them. Okay? With us, it mainly deals with the tongue. Okay? Do I inflict pain with my tongue or, any, or the way I behave or anything on anyone because they live a godly life? And our first thing is, no, of course I don't. But that's why we need to really think about this. But it's good not to just answer, just think about it, because you may not realize it right now. But. And if we, and we've talked about this before, when we ask God to show us our heart, mm -hmm. show us what really our heart is right now, He will. And that reflection that He shows us may not be likely will not be what I really want to see, but it's what I need to see. Okay. So those two questions, do I suffer any sort of persecution because I live a godly life? And two, am I the one inflicting the pain or punishment on anyone, on anyone because they live a godly life? Second verse is John chapter 15, verse 18. John 15, 18. Who would like to read that verse? Jen? If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. <laughs> strong one. So these are, these are Woo, strong Daddy. verses. These are ones that really need to make us stop and go, wow, just like Jen did. Wow. Not things to take lightly. This is God's word. If the world hate you, and the words are in red in my Bible, Okay, so yep. who's speaking? Jesus. Jesus. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Because we're called Christians, which means Christ-like or followers of Christ. So he suffered it first. The Webster's 1828 word that I looked up was hate. And it said, it was just short of abhor, abhor, abhor. So it's to dislike greatly. To have a great aversion to, like, I can't, can't stand it. Uh, that, that's the way you feel about it. Okay, abhor is a is even stronger word. You know, probably the strongest dislike feeling you can actually have. But hate is pretty strong word too. To dislike greatly, to have a great aversion to. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Ask yourself, number one. Does the world have a problem with me because of the life I live for Christ? Okay, I'm going to give you an example, and I can only <coughs> give you an example from my life because that's all I know, okay? I don't say it for any other reason other than that's what I know. I went to vote the other day at the, Bel at the Ben Logan hi High School, and I had been out doing grocery deliveries with my husband, so I had kind of, for me, it's athletic wear. And it's a skirt that has leggings attached to it. And it was all black. And so it's not like skirt and hose, but it, it's kind of athletic wear. Looks, but it's still a skirt that goes below my knee, you know, mm -hmm. my knee or below. Mm -hmm. And there was a lady coming out because we were hurrying, scurrying in to get in there to vote. And there was a lady coming out, and she was probably... 10 years older than me, so maybe mid to mid 50s to late 50s is what I assumed by looking at her. Just looked like a sweet coming up, you know, sweet gal, somebody's grandma. The woman stopped and looked me up and down and then scowled at me, gave me a dirty look and walked on. Really? Yeah, and, and, and I... I, I don't, don't feel bad for me. It makes me a little bit emotional, but the picture is so much bigger than that. I get that sometimes when I wear my skirts out like that, 
but I don't usually, I, I feel like this week I have had the hate poured on and I don't know why. <laughs> you know, and Jim, my husband, pastor said, God must just be trying to teach you something through it. But I just, I thought, oh my word, what, what on earth did I do? You know, and it makes me stop and look down like, do I have something on me? Did, did, is my skirt tucked up? You know, I, I didn't really know what was going on. And my husband said, Julie, it's just because it's a skirt and it's just your appearance. And that, that was the only thing it could be. And my guess, this is my guess, <laughs> is that she was going in voting one way and I was going in voting another way. <laughs> or she was coming out from voting one way and I stood for what a, what she didn't what she was against okay I'm gonna be very plain I'm going in to vote no <coughs> is what I voted on issue one because I'm not for abortion I'm not for taking away parental rights and my guess is, is that sh those were issues that she was okay with. So she came out, saw me, thought, yep, there's another one voting. That was the look I got of disgust. Oh, she's okay. So, and, you know, uh, it fits perfectly with if the world hated you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Hate to dislike greatly, to have a great aversion to. Does the world have a problem with me because of the life I live for Christ? I wore that skirt because I believe it was it is what God would have me do to be modest. I don't do it for any other reason. And that caused some hate coming from her. Question number two you can ask that we need to ask ourselves, and I'm asking myself these same questions. Do I have a problem or dislike of another believer because of the life they live for Christ. So many times, I feel like if I had gone and talked to that woman and it would have come out, she would have, she would have ended up telling me that she's a Christian or she loved the Lord or that she goes to church. This happens so much when we're out door knocking. You know, I'll say, do you get to go to church anywhere? I mean, or, you know, the person will get angry with me and then the next, you know, the breath before, they had just told me that they go to church or that they love God, and they're, yet they're angry and want me off their property. Yeah. Okay, so do I have a problem or dislike of another believer because of the life they live for Christ? I've said this before. If I really love Jesus, I will not have any problem in a negative way, any problem with somebody knocking on my door and wanting to invite me to church. Those two things do not go together, okay? And you can apply that to all kinds of different things. Um, do I have a problem or dislike of another believer because of the life they live for Christ? Next verse, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. 1 Peter 3, 14. Sure, Miss Donna. But, but, and if you suffer for righteousness, sake. Happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Thank you. But and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye, be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. And the Webster's 1828 word that I looked up was righteousness. Okay? And righteousness, the definition, best definition for it, no problem, was the conformity of life to holy principles or obedience to Christ. Okay, so going back to the verse, but and if ye suffer for righteousness sake. Christian, if ye suffer because you conform to, you have a life that conforms to holy principles, but if ye suffer because you're obedient to Christ. Okay, the questions to ask ourselves here are, one, do I embrace, grab onto the hate or terror of others caused by my obedience to God? Do I embrace that? Just bringing it back around to the example I gave, it made me feel really bad. It hurt my heart 
but it also made me feel bad when she did that, when that lady did that. But this verse tells me it should make me happy. Yes. Okay? And we can try to change God's word, but it's wrong if we do. God used the word happy in there. Okay? Yeah. But, and if ye suffer for righteousness sake. Okay, I was out, just using this example, I was out wearing my skirt because I believe that's what God would have me do. And the lady did not like it for whatever reason. And, and if she had looked at my face and acted that way, that's one thing. But to look me up and down and then act that way towards me told me that it was my attire. I'm trying to live for Jesus. And so her reaction should have made me happy. That's kind of weird to say, isn't it? It is. Kind of like and, it, and we try, and this is the thing is, is we try to, to make it say something else or to pretend it doesn't say that I should be happy about it. But it does say, God, it says happy. Okay? And I have another word where I, I think we're, no, oh, anyway, we'll move on. So the questions to ask myself, do I embrace the hate? or terror of others, am I happy because of it? Because that my obedience to God caused. And number two, the second question, do I cause terror or trouble to other believers because of their obedience to Christ? And again, we're not talking about physically hurting. We all know we're not going to do that. I'm not going to go slap somebody upside the head or stab them with the fork or take a gun. Our weapon is our mouth. And, and our actions, yes, those two things, that's what this is talking about. Do I, with my actions or my words, cause terror or trouble or pain or infliction on other believers because of their obedience to Christ? Okay, the lady didn't say anything to me. But what if she had? That, that would be the ex you know, an example. And I keep circling back around because I wanted to have an example to bring to you. But this covers a lot more things than just a lady looking at me that yeah. way. Okay, so we need, let the Lord speak to our hearts and bring examples in our own life to us. And he will. When we're asking him to do that, Lord, show me how does this apply to my life? He will bring those things to our mind. Mm -hmm. You've got mouths again behind that. But I had almost phrased too, um, causing trouble or terror to other believers because of their obedience. Perhaps that would also apply if you mm -hmm. see another Christian in a situation where they're being attacked or whatnot, and then you do not step in to support the person. That's good to... That, that could be just as bad. Yeah. You're not literally tearing the person down yourself, so, but you're not supporting them. But you and know... That could cause the trouble. Pastor brought out a verse. I don't know if it was in church or just one of our conversations, but it was about reproving the unrighteous works or the works of unrighteousness. Reproving. Oh, yeah. That has stuck with me because reproving means what? Means to correct. Mm, yeah. It doesn't mean to walk away and not say something. It means that we're supposed to, and that's another hard one that, you know, is like, I want to wiggle my way out of that part of the verse or make it say something else. But God actually said we're supposed to reprove. You know, uh, and, and that, that does, that's a perfect example, Tiff. So am I the one causing terror to other believers because of their obedience to Christ? Next verse, 1 Peter 3.16. So we're right there. Who has that one? 3.16? Yes, ma'am. Having a good conscience that wherein as they speak evil <coughs> of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as, as, as a, of evildoers, as if you were an evildoer, as if you were someone doing evil things, 
that they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. So the word I looked up, Webster's 1828, the word was conversation. And the definition that applies is behavior, especially as it pertains to morals. So going back to the verse, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your behavior, your good behavior in Christ. That's what that good conversation is. It's talking about the life you live for Christ. And they're accusing you and speaking evil of you like you were a person that was doing bad and evil things. But you're not. You're living a life for Christ because you love him and you're doing your best to live for him. So the questions to ask ourselves are, are, do people talk evil about your behavior and life? because you live a life for Christ. If they do, I'm supposed to be happy for it. Remember that other verse? Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be happy for it if they do. But it's easier to say than it is to actually live out. But God knew that too, and God gives us strength. Thank you, Jen. And then the other one is, do I talk evil of other believers because of the standards of holiness? They try to live out. This is huge, and this happens a lot. You know, and again, I can only speak to what I know. Over the years, you know, there have been times where we haven't had TV. Mm -hmm. Or our music, you know, our standards. We set our standards a certain way, and then we just had to let everybody do fuss and cry and whine and get on us about it. And we had to stand firm and say, this is what God wants for us. Why would somebody get mad or get upset because my standard is not what theirs is? I'm not even going to use the word higher. I'm just going to say, I have a standard placed in my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why would another believer, and, 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 and that standard is because I love Jesus and because I want to do my best for him. After all he did for me, I want to do my best for Jesus. Why would I ever have someone get mad at me? Or why would I be ever mad at somebody because they had a different standard that I did not in my life? Does this make sense? Yes. Yeah. I'm totally getting what you're okay. saying. <laughs> So do I talk, do, do people talk evil about my behavior even though I'm trying to live a good life? And this is the questions we're asking ourselves, not just me. <laughs> do I talk evil of other believers because of their standards of holiness they try to live out? Next verse, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. Who has that one? We're right there in the same area. Go ahead, Ted. I was wondering, uh, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, for it is better, if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For it is better, mm -hmm. if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. And the word I looked up in the dictionary in 1828 was command, or excuse me, will, which means the command or direction of our life. So let's put that in the verse. Mm -hmm. For it is better if the command or the direction for our life of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Question to ask ourselves: Number one, do I understand that God's direction for my life sometimes includes suffering? Do I understand that? I'm always trying to make my life easier, better, sweeter, happier. But I've got to understand that according to this verse, there are times in my life where I suffer because I'm trying to live for Him. I'm trying to live for God, trying to live a wholly separated life. There are times that I suffer in my eyes because that's the way and that God has 
allowed that and maybe even sent it my way. And that's another one that people try to get around. Oh, God wouldn't do that. You know what? God allowed all that to happen to Job. Okay? And God does send the fiery trials in our life so that we can come forth purer and more refined. We cannot understand his ways. And we can make ourselves silly trying to do that. Okay. But our thoughts aren't his thoughts and our ways aren't his ways. He's up there and God sees that whole beginning to end picture of Julie. And I can only see here and look back. But I can't mm -hmm. see what's up ahead. God sees all those pieces fit together. And he has the direction for my life. And sometimes, sometimes that's going to include suffering in my mind. You know, I think our definition of suffering is kind of warped. You know, think of back uh, when the Christians, the believers that believed in Jesus Christ were sent to the Colosseum to be eaten and killed by lions and animals and people, Burn, yeah. yeah, and people that were burned up. Now that's suffering. Man, I wish I would remember that when I start feeling a little bit bad. But so our life does, do I understand that God's direction for my life sometimes includes suffering? The second question to ask is, am I suffering for well-doing? Or is the suffering in my life for evil-doing? Okay, sometimes we think we're suffering for well-doing because we're being good, when actually, if we would seek God's face, he would show us, you're actually getting some chastisement now, you know, and there are consequences to our actions. And we got to be careful we're not chalking things up to, oh, suffering for Jesus, when you're really suffering for oh, chastisement. Yeah. And God's trying to bring us back around. Next verse, Matthew chapter 5, verse 11. All right, go ahead, Miss Carol. Blessed are you when men shall revile you. Revile. You're good. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. And persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. Thank you, Carol. And persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. That means lies. The Webster 1828 verse that I chose was blessed. Okay? Made happy or prosperous. So let's put her in that verse. Are you, am I made happy? Okay. Happy or prosperous are ye? It's not even asking me. It's telling me. Happy or prosperous are ye when men shall revile. And that word says, spoken of with reproach and contempt. Happy or prosperous are ye when men shall speak of you with reproach and contempt and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Okay, that last part again, for my sake. Someone's trying to, you're trying to live for Jesus, you're trying to obey him in every part of your life. You're trying to live a holy, separate life for him. And you've got people speaking lies against you. You know, they're, they're assaulting your character. They're assaulting the, the, your motives. And this is what happens when, when you try to live this life for Jesus because you love him so much. And Jesus allows it. And he wants to teach us through it. It doesn't mean it's easy to have people lie about you. It's not. Mm -hmm. It's happened, you know, again, I can only tell you about me. For, th what, 13, 14 years? What are we on here? I think about 14. Uh, well, okay. People have said some crazy lies about us. And I stopped getting upset or fighting it. Now they kind of make me chuckle. Like the one, 
that I heard of that we asked a church member to go ask her parents for $25,000. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so that was a nice that was a, a nice little lie going around about us. But it can be anything about my character, my walk with the Lord. And I, I'll tell you, with my husband, as a pastor and pastor's wife, when people attack the church, they're, they're attacking us. Everybody should feel this way. But I think a pastor and his wife really feel it. You know, we saw something online recently. And it broke our heart. But God is righteous, and he does all things. His judgment's perfect. And whenever they attack the pastor, yep. they get so much worse than they get about it. Uh, and people don't realize that. But when somebody attacks your church... It still hurts, though. Mm -hmm. it, it should hurt you just as much as it does me. And define, you know, the online thing is just like just something. It, it did, it broke our heart. But there have been many times over the years, and it does feel personal, and it should feel personal to each one of us because this is our church. And their lies or misunderstandings, a lot of times that's it too, misunderstandings. But no one bothers to come get the misunderstanding cleared up, you yeah. know, like just ask and we could clear it up for you or help you understand or you know so but I, I need to be happy happy when that happens when we saw that or when we heard this or you know <laughs> whatever I need to be happy and be like this is such a hard thing to grasp it is. God thank you thank you that you're counting me worthy and that I actually must be doing something right as far as living holy for you to have those lies come up you know mm -hmm. and and that's what we can hold on to when the lies and the the assaults on our character or the assaults on our church come up is just be like okay we must be doing something right for you lord let's keep on going and and let's be happy like yeah bring it on it reminds me of my husband because that's something he would say like yeah bring it on you know but it, and women were more emotional, all that stuff, you know. So things might sting a little bit more. But I need to go back to the scripture. I need to not depend on what I'm feeling and hang on to that because my heart's wicked and deceitful, and desperately, yes, you know, desperately wicked. And it's going to say, oh man, you need to nurse this one. You need to really hurt and grieve. And no, I don't. That verse says I need to be happy need to be happy. I'm doing something for you, Lord. I'm living my life for you. And, you know, constantly doing that mirror check. Lord, am I doing this for the right reason? Are my motives pure? Show me. Let me look in the mirror. I don't want to, but let me look in the mirror. Because if things aren't right, I want to change it because I love you. So the question to ask Number one, when others say unkind, hateful, untrue things about me for the cause of Christ, do I let it bring me down or do I let it make me happy because it was for Jesus? I got to admit, when I saw that online, I let it bring me down for a little bit. And pastor, whoo, it was hard. And over the years, it's been hard. But that's not what the verse says to do. So I've got to do what God says because God knows best. He sees beginning to end, and he knows that if I, if I do what that verse says, if each one of us does what that verse says, and we're happy when those things come up, that we're going to be better off for it. Because if, if, if I give in to my carnal, my fleshly self and nurse it and be like, why am I even? Okay, that's not what God has for me. That kind of attitude is going to lead me right out of church, right out of service for God, right out of a relationship with God. Now, it won't take away my salvation, but I won't have any kind of walk with Him if I nurse those wounds. Which is exactly what mm. Satan wants. Exactly. Instead, I need to be happy. So, how do I, how, do I let it bring me down, or am I actually happy? 
Number two, do I speak reproachfully or untruths about other believers because of the way they live for Christ? Do I say things? Man, we need to be so careful of our words and how we interact with people. Do I speak reproachfully or untruths? And you know it's an untruth if I know the difference and I hear somebody else saying an untruth and I don't correct that. Yeah. Again, yeah. it goes back to that verse, reproving. You know? Pastor, I, I know he's my husband. I get it. But man, does he show us some stuff from the Word of God that I've never seen and I've never heard. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't, even though he's my husband, I still check and pray about what he preaches. Mm -hmm. You know? And sometimes, you know, we'll get to talking and I'll be like, I'm, I'm, I'm still thinking on that. I can't say... I'm praying, well, and I do pray on it, but I can't, I can't say it's not right. Usually, um, okay, every time it has been. I've never been able to come back and say, well, actually, that's wrong because here this verse. I haven't been able to do it. But it, sometimes it feels so wrong at first because it's not what I've ever heard. And so sometimes the stuff that he will say, I'd be like, <gasps> that, are you sure that's right? But when I go to study it out and I go to, and I do pray about it and say, Lord, show me here. It's not that my heart is rebellious or anything like that. I j it is our responsibility to make sure that the man of God is showing us truth from his word. And if we can't, and if it's not, then we take it to him and said, you know, right time, right place, right attitude. And if you have a spouse that goes to church with you, He's the one that needs to do it. But otherwise, you as a lady will need to do it. But you better make sure you, ha you have your ducks in a row when you go. <laughs> because my husband knows his Bible and he walks with God. And I haven't come to this place yet where I can say, you got that one wrong. <laughs> and I don't want to. I don't want to. I just want to constantly make sure that, one, I have a, a correct spirit about it. Two, that I am researching and looking over the things he's saying and not just listening and going, yeah. And, and so you're going to end up saying, Pastor Frost said, instead of God said. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. what we need to be saying is God yeah. says, you know. And so, all right. So am, am I the one speaking reproachfully or untruths about other believers because of the way they live for Christ? Next first, Luke 6.22. It's a different kind of lesson, I know. I liked the other evening when the hubby brought up something in Catholic. I loved that. I love that. I love that. Because he is not about the spirit arrogant about it. Or anything like it, that. He's still learning himself. It was the fact and that he could tap into yes. a man who has pastored for thirty years or twenty that he that he he was okay. He's comfortable. And and it is a matter of not being prideful. Yeah. Okay. And I I'm trying to say this in the right way because I understand he's my husband. But I was very, very thankful to see that too. And I even told him, I said, I'm glad that you're not full of pride, that you can't listen to, or you couldn't stop and say, do you know that verse? Or, you know, that kind of stuff. And sometimes, you know, he can't, he's a man. He's a human being. He can't always remember things, mm -hmm. you know, or sometimes it'll come out wrong. We need to be gracious with our listening and understand mm -hmm. that. But it was so refreshing to understand he was okay with thank you for bringing that up He's because I felt the same way willing to learn and you know yes, he did bring up he was going to dig into it himself mm -hmm. to yep. see it yep and I just because <coughs> I he's, really appreciated seeing I that I did too I did too because um, he's growing too um, but yeah that was good Luke 622 who has that one I'm in the wrong spot I'm sorry Blessed are you. Okay. Blessed are you when men shall hate you and when they shall
to separate from you and from your company and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the son of man's sake. Okay, that last, <laughs> that last part, for the son of man's sake, for Jesus' sake. The words I looked up was separate, and that's to disunite or withdraw from. And then the other word was reproach, to upbraid, blame, or disgrace. So let's put it in those verses. Luke 6, 22. Blessed are ye. Okay, and we looked up blessed. Remember, made happier, mm -hmm. prosperous. Happier, prosperous are ye when men shall hate you. Okay, and we looked up hate, to dislike greatly, to have a great aversion to. Okay. Happier prosperous are ye when men shall have a great disliking for you, and when they shall disunite or withdraw from you, from their company, and shall reproach, they shall upbraid, blame, or disgrace you, and cast out your name as evil. For the Son of Man's sake, for Jesus' sake, they did all that. Okay? Basically, they're talking garbage about you, okay? And this is supposed to make me happy. They talk garbage about me. They withdraw their friendship, don't want anything to do with me. Got to tell you, that was probably the best thing ever when somebody withdraws like that from you. But these are the things to ask yourself. Number one, am I experiencing any of this type of righteous persecution? Okay, it's a problem in, in, in let the Lord show you the answer. It's a problem if, you're, if the answer is no. Because living holy and separate will cause some persecution in your life, whether it's spouse, family members, neighbors. You, you, in, unless you're a hermit and you absolutely do not interact with anybody <laughs> online or anything, if you are living holy and striving to live holy for Jesus, there's going to be some degree of persecution. If there's not, then there can't be holy living there. Okay? So just let God talk to you on that one, as I am. Number two. Have I learned to embrace, or in what I looked up this work, e eagerly grab, oh my, embrace, eagerly grab onto this hate, separation, blame, that God's word says will ine inevitably come my way when I live for him. God says, if you live for me, you're going to suffer. We saw all these verses. You're going to have a degree of persecution. The more you live for Jesus, the more persecution you're going to experience, okay? The more, and, and it might, like I said, our, de our definition of persecution and suffering is off from what martyrs had, but yeah. still, to us, it is suffering. It hurt my little, little sweet, soft feelings when that lady did that to me. It hurt my feelings when I saw that online. It, I have feelings. Mm. But yeah. I need to constantly go back to the scriptures and I need to embrace and say, okay, God, must be doing something right. If people are hating on us, on me, on our church, on the things we believe, on the standards in our life this much, they must be doing something right. And if I'm not, please show me. You know, again, making sure that it's, it, it's not that I'm not suffering for evil's sake because I'm doing something wrong and getting chastised for it, but that I'm suffering for righteousness sake because of Jesus. Philippians 1.21, who has that one? Go ahead. Jen? Oh, sorry. Oh, she can read it. Go ahead, Jen. Um, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. This is the bottom line of the whole thing. This is why we can make the sacrifice to live holy, to give up the things in our life, to do what God says, to try to be happy when I want to nurse my little wounds. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because my life is supposed to be about Jesus. Learning when to embrace the hate. Yep. I would have ever thought that I would have... <laughs> well 
you know, said that I need to learn to embrace hate. But in this passage, God has shown me that I do. You know, Tracy was pastor for 25 years, and I, I saw a teenager just beat into him one Sunday morning. My boy, he got up quickly. And you see different things, and you hear different things, and you're accused of different things falsely. They're not accusing you as much as they feel guilty for the lifestyle mm -hmm. they're living, mm -hmm. and they're they're mad at God. And so because of that, they're going to accuse somebody because they can see them. Yes. Mm -hmm. And although we, we do have to look back at our life and say, okay, did I cause something to provoke that? Um, even in our own children. Mm -hmm. And I've had to go back and say, you know, I'm sorry we did this wrong and this wrong, but our motive was right because we intended right, but we were human and we made mistakes. Yeah. You know? um, and that's helped. But we just have to realize the devil's going to try and discourage us in any, in any thing yep. that he can. Thank you, Teresa. And it's going back to the scripture and understanding God knows best. And if God says to be happy, and again, after I've asked him, can I look in the mirror? And can you show me if there's any wicked way in me and create in me a clean heart? <laughs> All right, goodbye to our online friends. I'm sorry.